Hi everyone, uh, my name is Remy Jetravin from GWM, I'm one of the organizers of the conference. Uh, so what we're going to do now, we're going to have four academic presentations. Uh, we have 30 minutes per paper, uh, which means we have to be a bit fast. Uh, we're going to have 18 minutes for the presentation. Then we're going to have five or six minutes for a discussion. And then we're going to have six or seven minutes for a Q&A. And so if you have comments, you should have your comments in the chat box, I think, or the q and I I don't know which one works. Um, all right, so we're going to start with uh, Nathan. Uh, Nathan Nunn from Harvard University is going to present the first paper, Transhuman Pastoralism, Climate Change and Conflict in Africa. So uh, if Nathan, uh, if you can uh, upload your slides. Okay, terrific. So you can uh, hear me, hopefully, and I'll try and uh, uh, keep on time. And so my strategy here is just to talk three times as fast as I normally would. We'll see how that works. Um, so. Okay, so the, the, the question here is about climate change in Africa and how does climate change contribute to uh, conflict in Africa specifically? And there's a number of reasons why we think that, well, Africa is gonna be particularly susceptible to climate change. And so low living standards, nat weak national institutions, uh, heavy reliance on agriculture. So we're gonna focus in this paper on one specific char additional characteristic of Africa, uh, which is often I think overlooked, which is that Africa has a very large, sizable pastoral population. So uh, about 22% of Africa's population obtains their income primarily from animals. And in terms of land mass, this is even higher at 43%. And amongst these pastoral groups, uh, the most are transhuman. And so these are transhuman pastoral, pastoralists, which means they're seasonally uh, nomadic. And so Historically, what has happened is this has created cooperative symbiotic relationships with agriculturalists that are in that are nearby or uh, in the vicinity, and it's these relationships that are particularly sensitive to climate change. Okay, and so just let me uh, explain the the mechanism here. And so for most of Africa, there's two main seasons. So we can think of a wet season, a growing season, and a dry season. And so this is showing these where precipitation is shown in this map here. Okay. Uh, and then which months are which depend on whether you're north or south of the equator. Okay, so historically and, and even today, what happens is during the wet season, transhuman pastoralists, which are denoted, just this is just a schematic here, is uh, uh, by red, right? Uh, so what they'll do during the wet season, during the growing season, growing season, is they'll actually be grazing their animals on uh, more marginal lands, right? And then farmers will be growing their crops in the more fertile lands. And that, so this is the, the blue here. So, so then during the dry season, what happens is the, the land that the farmers were using to grow is left fallow and herds are then moved to these lands where farmers were growing their crops. Okay, so farmers aren't growing their crops. This is after harvest. Uh, this is the dry season. So then the more marginal lands that the pastoralists were using don't have wild grasses on them anymore. So they move to this, to the, to the more fertile lands. Uh, so the animals graze on the land. This is no cost to the farmers actually. And there's an actual benefit where, um, the animals provide organic fertilizer. So it's a, it's very much a win-win situation and it's a very efficient use of land, right? Particularly in these regions where, uh, the Sahel, for example, where land is pretty marginal. Then during the wet season, the, the, the herds, the animals, so which are typically sheep, cows, um, will move back to the more marginal land. Uh, uh, in, so this is, yeah. Uh, what, and this tends to be the, or the pastoralists uh, inhabit. Okay, so here's just some examples of transhuman roots. Uh, this is from West Africa. They're all across the, the continent. And we don't have a strong sense of exact roots. So this is from the FAO publication. It gives you, uh, you know, a basic sense. Uh, a few things to note is obviously they cross national borders, which is, I think, relevant for the conference. Uh, they vary in range from basically a few kilometers to uh, hundreds of kilometers. So you can see the scale down here on the left is 250 kilometers. So some of these are getting close to 1,000 kilometers. Okay, so And they go primarily north-south, but there's a lot of different directions, east-west. And in other parts of Africa, they're, they're not going to be primarily north-south. Okay, so then we have climate change. So climate change is associated with increased temperatures. And for the African continent, an important and primary, I think primarily the important consequence of this is on precipitation. So through Atlantic warming, you have changes in precipitation within the continent. 
And this then leads to drought when you have uh, a series of adverse negative precipitation shocks. Okay, and so in the Sahel, this is what's been experienced since about the 1960s. Okay, and so what happens when you have droughts? So remember, this is uh, the wet season here, and this is kind of what the um, allocation should be like: is that during the wet season, transhuman pastoralists are on the marginal land. And then farmers are growing crops on the fertile land. Okay. So, but what happens if you have adverse rainfall shocks during the wet season, then there might not be enough phytomass or enough uh, plant growth in the more marginal lands. And then the pastoralists will come to the more, more fertile lands, but too soon before harvest. Okay. And so that's really the concern is interestingly, adverse rainfall shocks during the wet season. And this is a season that is more plentiful. So you might think that rainfall shocks can be particularly detrimental during, during the dry season or seasons, when, uh, the season when uh, there isn't much rain, but it's actually the season when there's more rain that we're really worried about adverse rainfall shocks. So less uh, rainfall than normal. So if the transhuman pastoralists come to the farmland prior to harvest, so during the wet season, this is what happens. This is actually a dissertation from a Ghanaian uh, scholar, their master's dissertation that uh, analyzed exactly these scenarios in Ghana, right? So the maize are destroyed uh, by these uh, uh, herds uh, and they're not fallow yet, so this is an issue. And then there's retaliation uh, often and the animals are killed. And then there's retaliation on the other side and then the police or the military get involved and if there's conflict, then this is coded as uh, state involved conflict or civil conflict in the data. Okay, so this is what we're interested in. There's many examples of this. Let me this up. This is motivated by reality. And so here's just these are just from the last year. Time magazine talking about this climate change and this affecting farmer herder conflict. An interesting aspect of this, and I'll show this, is that. Uh, transhuman pastoralists on average are more likely to be Muslim and the farmers are more likely to be Christian. So this is often results in uh, what's framed as religious conflict. And if you look at the, the quote here, they talk about Islamist uprising, right? Uh, and then here's an article from The Economist where they frame it 100% in terms of, of um, religious conflict. So there's a number of reasons to move from anecdotes to systematic evidence. So finding out is this systematic, are, are these just, you know, they, they could just be cherry picked or hand picked um, stories. And one interesting thing is, well, how much of that mechanism that I just described, the breakdown of the symbiotic relationship between transhuman pastoralists and farmers because of climate change uh, accounts for the recent rise in religious violence that we've seen over the past uh, couple decades, okay? And then most important, I think, relevant for everyone here is, well, what can be done to help the situation? So there's a number of tools that we often think about, and these are tools like um, uh, conservation projects, agricultural improvement projects, uh, increasing the prevalence of water, irrigation, et cetera. These all seem natural, uh, but this is actually similar to Chris's point. These actually don't get at the root cause of the issue, right? So uh, we're kind of treating the symptom rather than uh, what's really causing conflict in this situation. And then we'll find actually, so we'll find that these don't help at all. And, and when you think about the underlying theory about why there is conflict, then there's no, there's not actually not a logical reason why they should, right? Uh, and then we'll look at, well, there's actually a less obvious solution where if you talk to pastoral groups on the ground, they'll cite this, but it's, I think, by and large been overlooked by policymakers. So in the paper, I'll go through a super quick, we're gonna measure conflict with standard forces. Uh, the key here in our analysis is how you measure transhuman pastoralism. And so we're going to have this at the ethnic group level. We'll link conflicts uh, to ethnic groups based on location. I'll show you this. So the first is the transhuman part. And so this basically means mobile. Uh, and so there is data from the ethnographic atlas where you have a, have a measure of the traditional mobility. Here's the categories. It's a bit unclear because they don't measure transhumans uh, directly where you should have a cutoff between mobile and not mobile. So we have two cutoffs here. So semi-sedentary, for example, they're sedentary, but they do engage in transhumans. Okay, So that's a detail I can go into, but uh, we have two cutoffs basically, and the results are very similar for both. So the second important aspect is pastoralism, right? So we get this from a previous paper by Anka Becker, which is basically 
do you um, have animals and is are the animals that you have uh, animals that need to be herded? So goats, sheep, cows, rather than, for example, pigs or chicken. Okay. So, and then the measure of transhuman pastoralism is an interaction between these two previous measures, which are basically measures that range from zero to one. Okay. And so, uh, so I know I'm going fast, but I'm hopefully just giving you the essence of this. So transhuman pastoralism, here's a measure. It's going to be between zero and one conceptually. Uh, and this is the variation uh, across the continent in terms of traditional territories of the different ethnic groups. So there's certain groups that you might recognize the Maasai, for example, uh, in Kenya, uh, the Turkana here. Um, you can kind of see here, this is the Nile. So this is agricultural, and then it's surrounded by groups that were traditionally transhuman pastoral. This is the highlands of Ethiopia, which is agricultural, Somali clans. And then here, which you hear a lot of is the Fulani, okay? And if we use the broad measure, you see um, uh, something very similar, okay? So the analysis uh, goes through a number of stages. So the first very natural thing to do is just look at the cross section and say, if you're an ethnic group and you're surrounded by transhuman pastoral groups, is there more fighting? on your territory, right? And so this is just the cross section. We find that that is the case. Uh, then we move to something that's even finer, which is to look at the grid cell level. And so what we did with the first analysis is you take one group, in this case, the Messina, this is in Mali, uh, and then you would create an average of how transhuman pastoral all contiguous groups are. But obviously this location here, this group, the Zenega, is more relevant than this location here. Okay, so for the second analysis for each grid cell, and, the, and we look at grid cell level data, we say, what's the nearest neighboring ethnic group, right? Because lots of these conflicts are essentially typically between our, our across ethnicities. What's the nearest neighboring ethnic group and how transhuman pastoral are they? Okay, and this is what the analysis looks like in that case. And I'll actually show you these estimates. And what you find is if your nearest neighboring ethnic group is more transhuman pastoral, right? There's more conflict in your grid cell. And it doesn't matter whether you're transhuman pastoral. These are just different outcomes. Uh, but uh, what really matters is, is your neighbor transhuman pastoral? And for exactly that mechanism that we're interested in, that's kind of what you should see in the cross section. Okay. So then now we introduce climate change. So none of that is about climate change. Let's just, let's try and explore the data. Let's try and understand this. And so we're going to look at rainfall data uh, and so the reason is the mechanism that we're interested in is about plant growth, is about phytomass. So we're going to look at rainfall, uh, which we find is the primary determinant of, of plant growth in, in Africa. Uh, and we're also going to look at plant growth itself. And so you find a uh, very similar relationship. Okay. So why rainfall? Another interesting thing to look at, and this will be talked about in a few presentations, is temperature. And we know that temperature, there's a lot of evidence that temperature is associated with conflict. Uh, if you just look at the variation, this is how much temperature and rainfall has changed across the continent, you see that there's a lot of variation in precipitation uh, and much less variation in rainfall. So in some sense, this doesn't mean, or sorry, uh, in temperature. This doesn't mean that temperature is unimportant because all of this variation in precipitation is being induced by temperature changes, right? It's just macro level temperature changes over the Atlantic. Okay. so. To some extent, uh, we're going to have a lot more micro level variation in precipitation and temperature. And then the other reason is actually, if you look at phytomass and look at the climate science literature, so this is plant growth, that within Africa, uh, rainfall is much, much more important than temperature. Okay. And in the Sahel in particular, it's, it's, that's even 10 times more so, right? And so, which makes sense for anyone who's talked to farmers in Africa, the concern always is do we have enough rainfall or not, right? Uh, it's not really an issue of, you know, is it 30 degrees Celsius or 31 degrees or 32 degrees? That really doesn't affect plant growth. And in the Sahel region where, the, where there's a, the variation in transhuman pastoral groups or not, uh, this is particularly the case because uh, rainfall is so scarce. Okay. And this, this is consistent with existing studies. Uh, interestingly, if you do this globally or in Europe, Canada, North America, you find temperature is much, much more important, right? And I think that has to do with what's the constraining factor. In Northern Canada, where I grew up, uh, frost is hugely important. Okay. Uh, so this is the, the equation that we estimate, which is an interaction between rainfall that's experienced by my nearest neighbor, 
okay? And is my nearest neighbor transhuman pastoral? And then a lot of controls I won't go through, it's messier, it's less messy than it looks. Uh, uh, but basically what we're interested in here is um, my nearest neighbor, they experience a rainfall shock. So this is far, this is outside my cell. Are they transhuman pastoral, right? Uh, and how does, how does that then translate into conflict? So this is, these are the estimates here, which is basically if there's more rain, there's less conflict, or if there's less rain, there's more conflict. Uh, and, but this is only found, so rainfall in my nearest neighbor only matters if they're transhuman pastoral. That's basically what this is telling you. And interestingly, we see this for conflicts that involve the state. So police officers, the military, we don't see this uh, in the UCDP data for these smaller localized conflicts. Although I think those are still, those are occurring. I think there's some uh, issues or deficiencies uh, in terms, not deficiencies, but there's a reasonably high cutoff for the UCDP DP data. Okay. And we see it also with the ACLID data. So the magnitudes are large. I'll skip this because I think I only have a few, few minutes. Uh, also talk about robustness is a, uh, uh, you know, as is typical in econ papers, a uh, uh, whole load of robustness checks. Let me just show you one, because I think this is interesting. And um, in particular, what Dominic was mentioning about mobility being important, and we'll talk, we'll see this with Matthias's presentation. If you think of this transhuman pastoralism, it's really an interaction between two things, pastoralism and transhumans. So you can think of this as being a triple interaction right? Rainfall times pastoral times transhuman. So, you know, one thing we should maybe do is control for the double interaction. And interestingly, that, that also helps us to understand, is this about mobility? Is this about herding? Because there is a culture of honor uh, um, hypothesis and evidence for the, this psychological effect of negative reciprocity. Uh, and what you find is this is very much a story about rainfall interacting with uh, whether that group is transhuman pastoral. Okay, so we don't see it for just mobility uh, itself or just pastoralism itself. And that makes complete sense if you think of the mechanism, right? So that group that has an adverse rainfall shock, they have to be mobile, so they're moving to the farmer's land, but they also have to be bringing animals. So it's animals that have moved to the farmer's land uh, before harvest and they're killing the crops. So the story has a number of um, specific mechanisms. And let me just take you through these. So we find the effect in agricultural cells. Uh, much you, uh, more. Are we out of time? No, I was on the one. So I think someone else. Uh, oh, someone oh, said something? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. You're good. Let me know when we're out of time. <laughs> um, so um, it's in, you find effects in agricultural cells you find uh, much smaller effects in non-agricultural cells. That makes sense because adverse rainfall shocks, they're moving to the better land. You can estimate this by season. You find the effects in the wet season, not the dry season. Again, ex ante, this might've been counterintuitive because the dry season is when there's less water, right? And less rainfall. The wet season is the more plentiful season, but it's the adverse rainfall shocks in the wet season that lead to these conflicts why? Because uh, the herds are moving to the agricultural lands before a harvest. That's not where they should be during the wet season. You can look at phytomass rather than rainfall, and that's kind of just further downstream. You find the identical effect, right? Uh, you can look at phytomass by season. You find exactly the same effect. That it's the wet season uh, that matters and not the dry season. And the other thing is you can look at uh, temperature rather than rainfall. And what you find here, I think this is super interesting, is you don't find the same effects of this specific me mechanism uh, in temperature. So that means drier temperatures uh, in the grasslands really don't affect grassland growth. What really matters is rainfall. Uh, and so that you don't see that mechanism, but this doesn't mean that temperature is not important, right? So this comes out very clearly, and there's a lot of evidence on this, that the temperature experienced in your own ethnic group, so in your own area, does lead to more conflict, right? So, uh, so it's important that temp it's not that temperature is not important, but it's not important through this very specific mechanism that we're interested in. So, can our findings account for the recent rise in religious conflict? Uh, what you find th these are conflicts that we code a lot of detail here about how we do this as religious versus not. And you see this recent rise. If we just distinguish. Uh, conflicts by whether they're religious or not, we find that our mechanism has effects on both, right? And the marginal effect is very similar, 
but it ends up having a bigger effect on religious conflicts because as you can see down here, the mean or the baseline level is much lower, right? So this can explain a lot of the rise in religious conflicts relative to non-religious conflicts in the recent years. So it doesn't only have to do with religion, and this is again back to Chris's point about what are the root causes of this, uh, religion is, is kind of the window dressing. It's really not about religion, but it's a, the Islamic groups tend to be pastoral. Um, and these pastoral groups get in conflict with the farmers, which tend to be Christian. And then the farmers tend to have disproportionate political power. Uh, and then that provides the support for the Islamic groups, right? And that's how what they mobilize is. Uh, and so people support the idea of overthrowing the, the, the country. Okay, so the last thing, I think I'm almost out of time, the effects of foreign aid. So there's a lot of things that have been proposed to try and alleviate climate change and or conflict. And you think of, well, there's not enough, uh, uh, you know, productivity and agricultural uh, output. So let's try and improve that. Same with irrigation and water. But I can, won't go through all of these, but you can think about, well, the issue isn't that there isn't enough productivity in the farmlands, right? It's about what's going on in the transhuman pastor, pastoral land. So that's not going to help. Conservation and forestry is not going to help. Land titling, you might think, oh, well, property rights, that's not going to help. So I could go through, if I had more time, each of these, and through them, you know, thinking about the mechanism that we have in mind, none of these things actually help. Uh, and that's what we find when we look at the data. These things, there's no evidence that these are attenuating the effects that we're finding. In other words, the effects of climate change or adverse rainfall shocks in transhuman pastoral groups affecting conflict in agricultural lands. But what, what does matter and is political representation. And this is something you hear a lot on the ground. What happens is there are conflicts between these transhuman pastoral groups and then the, the farmers, but the farmers have much, much more support from the government. And there's actually also, frankly, a Western bias in terms of aid and in terms of our perceptions about what is modern uh, and, and, and what modes of production we're going to support. So there's a bias against transhuman pastoral representation in politics. In those places and those years where that bias is less extreme, then you find, and this is, so this is a greater uh, share of transhuman pastoralists uh, in uh, political power nationally, you find these effects are smaller, right? And once you kind of get enough power allocated or equal distribution, then these effects actually go towards zero. Okay, so the solution, at least from our, our evidence here, is uh, about political economy. It's not getting more water, it's not improving irrigation, it's not uh, saving the forests. It really is about uh, representation of these pastoral groups, which are tend to be politically marginalized. Okay, okay I'm very happy to have comments and I'll stop there because I'm sure I'm over time. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Nathan. Uh, now we're gonna have a discussion from Roland Otter. Uh, from the University of St. Gallen. Um, well, if it can take five minutes so that I can have five minutes for q &A. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Okay, uh, thanks to the organizers for letting me discuss this paper and thanks to Nathan for the excellent paper and, and interesting uh, presentation. So I think the, the story they're telling is very convincing. So the story is mainly that there is a relationship between herd, between guys that will call herders and guys that will call farmers. And this is normally symbiotic but droughts make herders move too early into farmer's territory and this leads to conflict. And kind of the main evidence they provide is that the cell is the level, it's kind of a cell year panel. And they show that there is more conflict in the farmer's territory if there is less rain or less biomass in neighboring herder territories. So my, my first comment relates to the story, kind of I was thinking about the role of wealth. So there could be a complementary story in there that it's just poor ethnic groups that attack nearby rich groups. And they are more, li more inclined to do so if there is little rainfall and they become hungry or angry or have just lower opportunity costs, whatever. So um, therefore I was wondering whether actually it's my guess is correct that herders are on average poorer than farmers. And if that's the case, maybe there is an interesting effect heterogeneity and potentially your main result could be driven mainly or exclusively by ethnicity pairs where the herders are actually poorer than the farmers. Um, but maybe it could also be the other way around. Maybe it's also driven by ethnicity pairs when the herders are actually equally rich or richer than the farmers. But that would be interesting to know, I think. Um, then I have some comments on the cell. So you use these grid cells of 0.5 to 0.5 uh, decimal degrees. Dominique, uh, nicely enough, called them little 
Um, if you compare them to some ethnic groups in not, like the Nana, they're pretty large, I think. Um, also, if you compare them to many other groups in Western Africa, these cells are not terribly small. So they are obviously smaller than countries, but they're not super micro-ish. And the concern I have a bit is that cells are not nested in ethnic territories. So if you think about this cell here, there are like the Bozo in here, the Nana, and there's a third group in, in here as well. So they're not nested. And what I think is currently done, but I'm not 100% sure, is that ethnicity is assigned to these cells based on the centroid, at least the centroid is mentioned in the paper. Um, I was just wondering whether this can lead to kind of a misclassification implicitly of conflicts. You think about this conflict here in this green cell. This is exactly the type of conflict that you actually talk about. Or, um, so this conflict takes place on a yellow homeland or territory. This is a farmer's territory. Nearby, you have a herder's group. So it's quite likely that these herders were fighting here with some domestic farmers or the police or whatever. Um, but if you assign the ethnicity of the antisar of the um, of the herders group to this entire cell, then you would actually not classify this conflict as one of yours. And potentially there could be the opposite. This would be this gray conflict, which I would argue would not be your conflict type, but you may classify it as such. Therefore, I was wondering whether there, you could kind of change the units that you're using. And I guess my preferred solution would be to actually define as a unit the grid cell ethnic territory intersection. What I mean by that is I would split multi-ethnic cells like this one here into a squiggly bozo cell, a squiggly nono cell, and this third squiggly cell, while keeping this cell here just a square grid cell it is, because there are no two ethnic territories intersecting. An alternative could be to actually have smaller grid cells, and thereby you would immediately have a lower share of multi-ethnic cells. And you could easily do this. You have this biomass data, which is available as an extremely high spatial resolution. So that could be interesting and also kind of in line with your results towards the end of the paper, where you relate, talk about spillovers and the modifiable aerial unit problem. Um, then there's this policy section that uh, Nathan could only briefly mention towards the end, which I think is really interesting. Um, the the part on political representation I liked a lot. So they find that this effect becomes weaker when herders are represented in the government. I was just, I think there could be alternative ways to measure um, representation. Currently they are using the ethnic power relation data, which to me is not, it's not always super clear how this is coded. And then because this comes as kind of categorical variable, you sum over these categorical variables, which may or may not be the first best thing to do. Um, the alternative would be to actually measure representation more directly by just looking, what's the share of herders in cabinet positions? And there's this nice paper by Francois Reby and Reiner, uh, Reiner and Treby, which came out in Econometrica a couple of years ago, which actually collects this data already for uh, 15 Sub-Saharan African countries. And they wouldn't be surprised if other people have collected more such data. Uh, I dropped a part on the irrigation aid because I think this has changed slightly as relative to the version I've seen. Um, here is a, a bucket list of some more comments. I maybe would just like to mention the second because um, that's kind of something that's very common to papers talking about climate change. So, so that's not specifically about this Nathan's paper. So climate change is of interest and you motivate it by climate change as, as many people do if they talk about climate change and growth, whatever. But then actually uh, what you exploit is year-to-year -year weather variation. Uh, and of course, obviously you do so to establish causality. I'm just wondering um, if this is, a, this is kind of this slow change over time, there might be some adaptation mechanisms playing a role which do not play a role on a year-to-year -year basis. So I was wondering um, what the relation is. I leave it with that. I got the zero minute signal already. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Roland. This was great. Uh, Nathan, it's up to you. Like, we maybe we can take more questions from the panelists. Uh, I didn't see any question in the chat, but like, yep. if other people here want to make some comments, uh, and then Nathan can have a, a like a global response or something. Okay. In, uh, in that case, I have a quick question. Then, uh, usually, when the the herders move to the south, it's for um, to have access to the vegetation. But they also sell the, the livestock at the different markets in, in northern Nigeria, 
northern Cameroon and, and sometimes the livestock goes all the way to the coastal areas because this is where the income is. So does it mean they're selling their livestock early as well? Or like they're coming back to the area and then they come back and then they sell the livestock. So I'll be very interested in knowing more about the livestock markets as well. And then I see Irene use a SCAD data set, which is more like social conflict. You use an ACLED and Chala. So I wanted to know if you had some results on that as well. Can you repeat the last sentence? Oh, uh, you use a you use a ACLED and and Uchala yeah. data set, but you didn't use a SCAD, which is social conflict database. Uh, they're supposed to measure more like non-armed conflict, and so yeah, because I was thinking armed conflict in your case is like state conflict, and so I was I was actually surprised that you, that's where you see the results. Okay, terrific. Um, yeah, should I take ahead. more questions or should I just respond? I can respond now. Um, so the, so for the SCAD database, yeah, so we can look at that. We haven't looked at that actually. I'm not, I'm not super familiar with that at all. So I haven't worked with it. So that's great. And then, um, yeah. And you know, with the, with the UCDP data, it's true. Like they have this particular definition of you need to be in a politically organized actor or something to be involved. So it's already basically ruling out all these small scale conflicts. The ACLA data doesn't do that. And so, um, you know, if if we dig deeper into the ACLA data and who's involved, we do see evidence of these smaller scale conflicts being affected. So maybe the SCAD database is going to be even better at, at digging at digging into that. So um, so I agree with that completely. Uh, in terms of selling animals, so um, you know, we need to really, as soon as COVID is over, kind of go and 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 be there and talk to people and. Uh, and to get a sense of, of these things anecdotally. So my guess is definitely that that's, you know, if the animals are moving to these other territories earlier, that they'll also sell them earlier, right? And so, uh, so I'm sure that's going on in the, in the, in the background. Um, so, but, um, and then just um, on, for the discussion, I think these are all, these are all fantastic. Uh, and uh, so th thank you very much. Uh, the one thing I'll mention, so the Francois et al, definitely we can do this for the 15 countries and maybe verify the, the EPR data. Uh, we can definitely use smaller cells. Uh, so I think that's that's a natural thing to do. There's no reason that half a degree is is uh, what we should necessarily be using. So we can, we yeah, we've done some stuff checking the sensitivity. And then the big one here is I think the long run adaption, which is, as you say, an issue with climate change in general, is a lot of the effects of climate change uh, today might be two or three or four or five years down the road. Uh, and so one thing which is interesting about our mechanism, it's a completely contemporaneous mechanism, right? So you have these, there's not enough grass where the animals are grazing right now. So they move right now. Uh, and then that causes the problems. Of course, there is dynamics in terms of conflicts and hostility relations and breakdown of cooperation relationships. But in terms of the specific mechanism, it is a contemporaneous mechanism. Uh, so it's actually the cont contemporaneous setup that we have is actually particularly well suited for this mechanism, even though typically with climate change, that's always a, 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 a tricky issue. So great. Uh, we're five minutes behind, but I think we have time for one question in, in case there's another question from anyone here. Well, as always, you send your Comments to uh, Nathan or Aon directly. Uh, by okay, email. thanks. Thanks awesome. very much. Thank you so much.